We're very honored and grateful to have JJ Smith with us today to chat cricket and about his career and all the ongoings that's been happening in the cricket world. So JJ, what a pleasure. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. JJ, interesting things, interesting developments in cricket in South Africa at the moment. And obviously the big talk is um, the new sort of tiered system where there's A division and B division in cricket. Where will you be next season? What's happening in your side of the story there? Yeah, firstly, just thank, th- thank you for having me on the show and everything like that. It's, it's really a privilege to be here. Um, but yeah, obviously, there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of change. Um, I think it's probably been the most movement that there's ever been in a, I'm going to call it in a domestic yeah. season after this last season now and going into the new structure where you're going to have two tiers. Um, I'm still going to be based in Port Elizabeth uh, with no longer the Warriors and now be called Eastern Province. Um, okay. So, yeah, that, that's going to be really exciting. Um, obviously, growing up, I played for Eastern Province because that was the, the provincial side that I always belonged to. So, you know, playing for the Warriors was a dream come true. But obviously, it does bring about a, back a few memories about when I first went to St. George's and watched Eastern Province play, the likes of Western Province and all that. So, it does bring back a few memories and stuff like that. Ah, good. Looking forward to it. It's going to be really, really interesting. But there also must be some, some positives that it's coming out because it, there's always been people who say, well, now franchise system is gone and some players are going to lose out. And perhaps to a certain degree, yes, but there has been lots of movements. I'm sure people are, are making a way forward for themselves. What do you feel could be some positives for the new system? Look, I think, I think the big thing in the last couple of, well, maybe not this past, I'm going to call it the last season of franchise cricket, but definitely before that, there was very much a, a reluctancy of change within the franchise system. And what I mean by that is it was very hard for players to move, um, for guys to get into unions and uh, new unions. So if you're from Port Elizabeth, for you to go and play cricket in Pretoria or Western Province or, you know, that it was really difficult for the movement. Um, you know, there was very much a, a homegrown talent that was always referred to when it came to stuff like that. And I think obviously... Um, what this new system will create, especially with promotion relegation, it's going to create a lot of movement for players yeah. and unions. Yeah. And I think that that's for me that's exciting because if I look back in the day, you know, you had you had players who played for various provinces. It wasn't just one or two provinces. You know, they played for four, five, six teams. You know, and I think, you know, that with that you you develop um, a different skill set because you have to de- adapt into different cultures, different change rooms. You deal with different coaches. And I think that can only benefit cricket in South Africa and then I think it will only benefit the players. So I think that's obviously a really a positive one. I think obviously the big thing also for players is now, I mean, I remember I saw a, a quote from Dave Nosworthy. This is a number of years ago where he spoke about, um, he, he, he coached in the county system. I'm not sure for how long, but he said uh, something along the lines of, there's no greater feeling um, than, than being in line to be in contention for the county championship when you get to the end of the season. Mm. He said, but there's also, no, there's no worse a feeling than when you're fighting off relegation with your three games <laughs> left and you know you've got to win. He says the stress yeah. that goes into that. So I think what it will do is it definitely creates a lot more edge when it comes to um, performances and all that with, or with players, coaches, uh, unions, everything. I think there'll be a little bit more um, results driven now. I think, um, Possibly in the last couple of years, uh, unions have almost lost the way of that and, and have almost referred to homegrown talent, how many players we're producing for here and stuff like that. And I think at the end of the day, is, um, I think if you look at the Proteus side, for example, we're getting, Proteus side is getting quite, copying quite a lot of abuse on social media and it's pretty much because we haven't won. That's plain and yeah. simple. I think as soon as, as soon as we start winning, all that abuse will vanish. I think it's pretty easy, yeah. self-explanatory. Yeah, and it, it is a tough one to deal with that abuse, John John, but you know, you know, you you in the, the thick of it there, so we don't always maybe understand the whole picture. And that must also be something that I think might bring a lot of almost relief, like you're saying, the sense that there's something to win now and you don't, you don't want to get relegated. And I think that's definitely going to up the level a lot. And it, if I'm not mistaken, it's, it's almost similarly based to the county championship, similar sort of idea. Yes. Which is a good yes. thing. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's a good thing. So I think, I, think, I think what's also happened in the past is you get, you get to the back end of the season and, and what, whatever competition it is. You've generally got 
one, two, three teams that are in the line for winning the trophy. Um, and then you almost get those dead rubber games. And, um, and that's what I want to see. Yeah. yeah. So I think yeah. that's what this system is now going to create, which is going to be, which is going to be awesome. Um, I think too, what's going to be nice is um, with it, with, again, I, from what I've understood, I don't obviously know this, if it's set in stone or anything, but with the, the relegation and promotion working across all formats. Um, oh, wow. Well, yeah. Yeah, it means that yeah. teams teams can come in and do well, and all of a sudden you can have a team from I don't know Eastern or someone like that border Kwazulu-Natal inland. Those kind of teams hosting an Mzansi team the following year, kind of thing, which I think will be really exciting. You know, yeah. so something like that's going to be really exciting to see because it's in the past, as you say, the Mzansi league has been an unbelievable league to be a part of. The quality cricket was great, but um, mm. as you said, it's going to be exciting because there's going to be change. Well, maybe not for the first two years, but after that, there'll be a change every single year, which I think will bring a new dynamic and excitement to, to Saiyan cricket. Absolutely. No, absolutely. They need to do that. And I think the next thing would be great if they could actually televise a few more games. I'm just, just putting it out there. It would be nice if we could see a few more games. Um, anyway. No, no. I, yeah. I, I agree with you. I think um, the, 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 there was only positive talk about when they, they uh, televised one of the four-day games. Oh, it was fantastic. You, you only got positive feedback about yeah. it. There's no negative stuff, which I think just shows that people are desperate to watch domestic cricket in South Africa. No, it's nice because, I mean, you, you want to see these guys getting picked for South Africa, obviously, but you want to see what they're actually doing, you know, at the end of the game. It's, it's nice. You don't want to just see it on Cricket Info all the time. But anyway, it's... Yes, 100%. <laughs> but I, I, I'm sure you're Mr. Warriors. It's been a great, great uh, period to watch how the Warriors have, have dominated in many areas. But there's been many occasions... You guys have really risen to the occasion and done fantastic things on number of number of fixtures. Um, you guys are always ready to prove a point more often than not, weren't you? Yeah. Look, I, I think um, we were um, we were definitely a team that maybe always didn't have the the big name players, the superstars, and stuff like that. But uh, the Warriors' big strength for years. Um, and it's still now is we've, we've always played very well as a team. We've played yeah. for each other. We've played for, for the Eastern Cape. I think if you have a look at our support base in, in East London and Port Elizabeth, we've always been a pretty well-supported team. The fans are very loyal. They're very proud of us. And, and, and we obviously, we, we fed off that kind of stuff. And I think, um, you know, for, for us, it's, it's, it was really exciting. Well, I loved every minute playing for the Warriors. Um, just, just the way we played, you know, kind of that never say die attitude, um, always in there with a the fight. And, and, you know, we, we always enjoyed taking on the big teams because, you know, it, it was exciting for us to, to kind of, I don't want to say prove a point, but in many ways it was to prove a point because a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people always used to write us off, mm. um, especially in my early few years at the Warriors. A lot of teams used to write us off. And, um, yeah, it, as you said, it was always nice to come in and, and play these big sides and compete with them and, and sometimes get over the line against them. But, but talking about never say die attitude, John, John, you've definitely got that because talk about list A cricket, you know, 30 half centuries, just over four and a half thousand runs, I believe it is. That's helped you with your batting from a, that perspective, hasn't it? Your never say die attitude. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of been a, you know, for me, um, I was given a, a kind of a role at a very early age in the Warriors to kind of go out and, and be aggressive as a batter. Um, so I suppose if you look at it, that's why my um, my half centuries number is quite young. My centuries number is not so high. Um, you know, I've 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 always been a guy. Who don't look at my conversion rate; it'll be terrible, kind of thing. But um, you know, it's it's we've kind of it was kind of where we kind of it suited my game too, where I could almost take the game towards the opposition, try and play on the front foot, and I think um, that's exactly how the Warriors want to play. They they mm. they've always been like an aggressive brand. We come out, we come out swinging. We want to throw the first punch, and we kind of leave it all out in the field. And if we're not good enough, we we put a smile on our face and we move on to the next game. And I think um, that's also, as you said, suited the way I've played because I think um, I, I've always been a guy um, the way I've played, and and even a bit the way I captained. I always like to be an aggressive kind of player, aggressive captain, where we kind of you know throw the first punch, see what happens. I'd, I'm a big uh, a risk taker in many ways, and I've I've always enjoyed that about the Warriors is that we've 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 thrived under those kind of conditions when we play like that, and it's been really exciting to to play with and be a part of everyone in that system. 
Yeah, I could never ever write you guys off, and that's good. That's really good because that also makes cricket, uh, cricket exciting. Sorry, <laughs> good to see John on brilliant. But now, with the ball now, also in this day cricket, your best figures are four, four, four. Could you tell us a bit more about that game and what actually happened? How did it all unfold? Um, so that game was in Kimberley. Um, it was, it was. Uh, I think it, it was something along the lines of the the weather played obviously a massive, massive role in it. It was something along the lines of it had been dry the week before, where it had been really hot, like thirty-five to forty degrees, and obviously I think the the groundsman knew that there was a massive thunderstorm rain kind of coming and basically what happened is is I think he prepared the wicket quite early um, let's say our game was on like a Friday he, by Monday that week the wicket was already prepared but it, it absolutely was like torrential rain I think for like Tuesday Wednesday Thursday because I remember wow. we didn't even we didn't even practice yes wow. um, and and we managed to basically throw sawdust on the field and, and we got a game um, yeah, and, and as I say, the wicket obviously just got worse and worse in terms of the, the turn. Um, and I think if I remember that game, we I think we probably bowled 10, 10 overs of seam up front where I think our opening bowlers bowled five overs each. And after that, we had the Warriors kind of where, where in that era where we had a lot of guys who could bowl spin. We had Colin Ingram bowling some leg spin, Simon Alpha, Harmer bowling some right and off spin, myself with some left arm spin. We also had Colin Ackerman some right and off spin as well. So we had a lot of options. So we actually bowled a lot of spin to them. Yeah. Um, and I was obviously just very fortunate um, uh, where Colin Ingram and Simon Armour kind of took care of the, the left-handed batters. And I was lucky to get into the, the, the middle order and tail enders where I could come in and, and, you know, just kind of run in, hit the length, and, and as you say, one would go straight and a few would turn kind of thing. <laughs> well, well done, JJ. I think, yeah, that's, that's excellent. Well done. <laughs> but you've, Thank you. You've done really well overall. You know, combine the batting, bowling, great example of an all-rounder. Um, and it's, it's been really awesome to see you, how dedicated you've been to the Warriors. And although, yes, you're still carrying on, although it's had a different name, and you're obviously leaving the Warriors, so to say. Yes, yes. It takes a lot of dedication to do what you've done. But it must also make you feel that, well, the Warriors have brought out the best of me, so I'm going to sort of pay back to them what they've given me. Has that sort of been like the relationship there? Yeah, look, I mean, there have been a few times, um, you know, where, where I would have, I would have, you know, the, every your career's always got a few bumps in the road and stuff like that where I felt like um, I maybe needed a change, I needed to move. Um, and again, it, it it kind of just didn't work. It didn't happen, um, kind of thing. Um, yeah. So I mean, obviously, I think um, you know the the one the one thing how it always works is that uh, with a team like the Warriors, it's been absolute privilege to to play with the team. It's it's. I mm. mean, I, I remember Rivash Govan said when he came from the Dolphins as the as the assistant coach, and he came to the Warriors as assistant coach, and he said. The one part he can always speak so highly about the Warriors that to fit into the team was like so easy to do. Sure. He just came in, guys accepted who he is. He could be himself, he could be normal, and we just moved on. There was none of this feeling out each other or anything like that. That's just that's almost been like a, a very big Eastern Cape um, kind of personality trait amongst us, where we kind of accept uh, everyone for who they are, and and we we enjoy playing with each other and we have fun. I think and. You know, that's obviously been really exciting. Um, you know, obviously, you know, when I was growing up and everything, when I say growing up, I'm talking about in my in my middle ages or early on in my career, I considered maybe moving at that stage just purely because, you know, things like, for example, a lot of Titans players are getting selected. A lot of Cobras yeah. players are getting selected. Yeah. With those teams doing well, you, you always think, well, geez, if I, if I maybe make a move, it might help me enhance my chances of playing for South Africa and stuff like that. You know, but but in the end, as I say, I've been very happy with my decision to stay at the Warriors. Um, as I said, it, it brought out the best in me as well, um, and it's been it's been really exciting, um, as you say, to play for the people of the Eastern Cape. Yeah, but also again, talking bring out the best in you and JJ. Again, you, you lead from the front on a number of occasions, but the one specifically was in 2019. It was a good year for you, and you spoke about the Mzanzi Super League, which I think is a really good competition. I think South Africa needs something like that. And we'll touch on the RPL later and why I'm saying what I'm sure. saying. But it's competitions like that which seem to bring the best out of you as well because I think you made 219 runs for your team, leading run scorer for your side. Those competitions really are something that you enjoy and, and aim for to be a part of. No, most definitely. Um, 
you know, as I said, when you when you speak to some of the overseas players, the guys like Dan Christian, the Christensen, and all those guys, those guys have all said that um, the Mzansi Super League, standard-wise, is is bigger is better than the Big Bash. Um, mm. Obviously, um, you know, South Africa, we do have our, our issues with regards to we don't have the funding that that the yeah. Big Bash has when it comes to things such as broadcasting and all those yeah. kind of things. But but as you said, it's 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 a wonderful tournament to mm. be a part of. Um, you know, and, and, and hopefully it can continue because the, the, the other exciting thing about it too is that you obviously, you create a, a brand awareness, if I can put it like that, amongst your teams, but you obviously also can get some new fresh faces into your side, which obviously creates excitement as well, you know, and I think that's been the, the real exciting thing as well. No, absolutely, absolutely. That's brilliant. Um, but T20 Cricket for you has been, I'd say, an interesting journey, interesting path for you. Um, how do you handle the desire that you want to play for South Africa, but often it's not always the team dynamics that are what you're hoping for, but you've also got to accept what the Chiefs are saying. So, JJ, how do you sort of handle that? Because you've proven your worth in 2020 cricket. It's, it's an interesting one for you. Yeah, look, it's it's actually been quite T Twenty cricket. It's it's been a it's T Twenty cricket is like a love hate relationship. <laughs> when it's going well, you absolutely love it and you love the format. And when yeah. it's not going great, you absolutely hate it. And I think um, you know, the really exciting thing about T Twenty cricket, obviously, is that it's an exciting game and everything like that. But it's also a highly skilled game. And and I think if you have a look at through years in the RPL that the guys have played, is generally the team that wins is the team that's had the players who also in form. Um, yeah. So if you can have a team that plays and you can you can hit form with your team, you generally will stand a good chance of winning it. And I think, um, you know, for me, as I said, when I started my career, I was very much an opening batter. My role was to, to take the game on the front foot, go and play aggressively, you know, and win games. And I suppose in the last five, six years, I've kind of had to change a lot more. We have batted at three, I've batted at five, I've moved around a lot in the order. Um, you know, and, and, and I don't have an issue with that. Um, obviously, the big thing with that, though, is people are always are very quick to judge you on your stats or on your numbers and stuff like that instead mm -hmm. of looking at things like role definition and things like that, which, um, again, obviously, initially, journalists and, and, and public don't always understand that because they don't sit in a team meeting and actually know what's going on and stuff like that. But I think the, the biggest thing, I think, in T20 cricket, um, you know, I've, I've always, as I said, I've, I've always played, played to win. And I think that's probably the biggest uh, you want players to play. You want players to play to win because in T20 cricket, it, it is the case where you literally can win the game in by yourself in the space of a couple of balls. And I think um, that's what all the great T20 players do. They, they, they play to win and, and they do it more often than, than the regular guys. And I think that's that for me is the exciting thing about the game. Yeah, and just briefly, you saw Chris Morrison for Rajasthan Royals. He, yeah. He turned the game on his head off a few balls. So 100%. It's, yeah, changing yeah, cricket is oh, it's interesting. But based on that, do you feel that the current squad that's playing in RPL, but well, certain cricketers are playing in RPL, they really need to perform well in preparation for the 2020 Cricket World Cup, or does it not really matter at the moment? Um, it's, 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 I suppose it's a tricky one. Obviously what, what performing well does, it obviously gives you confidence. Um, I saw yeah. Henry Claus and basically said, made a quote the other day where he spoke about the RPL is basically like a world cup. And, and I would agree when, I, when I've spoken to a lot of the coaches who've been involved in RPL, Eric Simons, those guys, he's always referred to, um, basically the RPL is like the starting point for the year and how T20 cricket might evolve or develop and new things coming into play and stuff like that because it's almost like the first reference point. And I think, um, you know, it, it's... So for our players, obviously, performing well and all that will give them a lot of confidence because it almost is like an international tournament. Obviously, though, from the World Cup to the RPL is still, what, four or five months away. Yeah. So there's still, a lot yeah. of, there's still a lot of cricket that needs to be played beforehand and all that. Um, and obviously, things like, you know, going into a World Cup... I think for South African wise, obviously we're going to want our players to be in form. That's going to be the big one and have clear role definition, clear clarity on how everything go, goes. And I think, you know, we, we've still got a good bunch of players. I mean, yeah. you know, David Miller walked in to Rajasthan Royals the other day and played an unbelievable knock. And, you know, we forget that Oaks, that Oaks, one of our players, he, he's yeah, done true. well for South Africa. So, so, 
that's another guy who's going to be batting in the middle order for us. So it's it's exciting, and all we've got to hopefully we've as you say we've got to hope that guys we can get out of our top six batters we can get four guys who have the tournament of their lives. Yeah, and you have out of your five six bowlers you have three of them who also have the tournament of their lives, and you never know you can win a World Cup from there. So I think that's just the big thing for us if we can really just peak at the right time, have clear role definition and everything like that. You just, the sky's the limit because the talent's definitely there when it comes to our South African side. If you have a look at it, the guys are all world-class players. It's just about, as you say, kicking at the right time. No, for sure, for sure. Then, John, John, I'll ask you this. And um, obviously, a lot of the guys went to the RPL and then we lost the 2020 series against Pakistan and a lot of negative emotions. Um, it's a tricky one because in the same breath, you want to give youngsters an opportunity to play um, and you're getting to play against a really good um, international side in Pakistan that you do really well with a white yes. ball. Um, where do you sort of draw the line and say, well, okay, we're giving opportunity here for the young guys. Where's your um, unconditional support? Or was it just a bit of a really difficult thing to do for the youngsters play against Pakistan? I mean, Pakistan were at full strength. Yeah, look, obviously it's difficult. I mean, I, I've played a lot of my international T20 cricket um, with not South Africa's full strength side. If I look in my career I'm talking about, there's yeah. been a lot. So I played in Pakistan where we didn't have our full strength side. Yeah. Uh, my, first eight, my first eight games, I think it was, um, they treated T20, my first eight T20s for South Africa, which I think started in 2017, 2016, around there, the T20 side is almost treated as like a blooding side. So you played in a very inexperienced side. Yes. Um, and, and look, it was really great. And I'm, I've been very lucky to play this amount of cricket for South Africa and everything like that. But obviously, I do believe that, you know, if I could bet with, let's say, a 5 2 plus C, a Quentin de Kock, and A.B. de Villiers, you definitely learn a bit more because you're literally watching the greatest players in the world go about their business. Um, it's all yeah. great watching them on TV, but when you actually physically bat with them on the other side, it's it's such an eye-opener. And I, I was fortunate enough once to bat with A.B. de Villiers um, in England at Somerset where we batted together. And as I say, that was probably one of the best times in my career where I could what, go about watching someone go about their business where I was like in complete awe. Uh, of him because I mean obviously he is unbelievable you know and what he can do and I just said it's a pity that I maybe I think I've played about 15 T20s for South Africa now that I've it's probably been less than three or four times that I've been able to do that where majority 10 plus games I've had to play with I don't want to say fringe players but as you said a lot of young players because T20 cricket has been used as a a blooding experience, give guys opportunities, see what they can do, stuff like that. So, as I said, that's the way I feel. Obviously, that's my personal opinion. Um, again, though, sometimes uh, I don't understand the bigger picture about it because I'm not involved when it comes to selection, running yeah. of teams and stuff like that. Yeah. I do I do, I do, do accept that and everything like that. Um, you know, because, again, you could have a squad of 15 players that you keep playing over and over and over and over. And, three months, two months before a World Cup, four of them break down. And then you don't know who your next four players are in line. So things like that do happen. So I do accept that kind of thing. And obviously right now also, COVID has created so many issues as well. Yeah, so, yeah. So I think, no, for sure. I think, I think, uh, I think we, all, uh, we all as players will accept that now as well. So I think, yeah. But I mean, you know, obviously it, it, it was tough to watch the guys go down against, in, against Pakistan. Um, you know, but again, we... You know, probably for, let's call it the last game where we were totally out of the game and we somehow managed to bring the game back again. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, all, the, all, the, all the other games, the first game, you know, we were there, we were close enough there, a couple of overs there. We obviously, we, we won very convincingly in the second game. You know, the third game was another real close game. Um, so, you know, we, we, we close. And I even play in the series in Pakistan, same thing. The first game was really close. We just lost the second game, you know, we, we, we won, I don't want to say convincingly, but we won it not at the end. We were, you know, we were always ahead of the game kind of thing. And then obviously the series decided we were kind of out the game. David Miller played a knock of his, one of the greatest knocks I've ever seen. And yeah. we were right in it until the last few overs. So it just shows that we, we, we're getting there. But obviously, you know, we just, at the moment, it's probably, um, we've almost, 
lost that feeling on how to win, you know, and how yeah. to get over the line just yeah. in those crunch situations. Um, and as I say, it's just like it'll be like riding a bike again. We've just got to do it two or three times in a row. And all of a sudden, you'll find in those tight situations, we'll start winning those games instead of losing them. So that's going to be the interesting thing. Definitely, definitely. But yeah, it's, it's nice to hear your response. JJ. I think you summed it up very, very well. There. It's, it's really, really good. Yeah, because I mean, we obviously, like we mentioned before, we are a very expectant nation. South Africa must win. You know, <laughs> it's, yes. you can't. It's, it's impossible. But anyway, we, you know, we'll take the positives and negatives as long as we can move forward. Um, I mean, uh, I've seen some things about how people have gone hard at Mark Batch, and I think it's really ridiculous. Um, that guy's a world-class player and coach. I don't see how you could... Anyway, but that's my, that's my opinion. <laughs> yeah, look, obviously, as you say, he, um, he hasn't won. Yes, and he, mm. I think they said he's lost eight out of 11 series. Yeah, that's not great. I think, and, and, and it is terrible. Um, I think the other big thing that we've also got to accept too, though, is that um, he did take over our side in, in quite, a, quite a difficult time. Very difficult, if, JJ. If you have a look at our, our kind of generation of players, the, the A.B. de Villiers era, Hashim Amla, A.B. de Villiers, J.P. Dumini, Fap du Plessis, Vernon Philander. Yeah. You start adding Dale Stein, Mornay Morkel. <laughs> well, all, those guys, all, yeah. all those guys kind of left all in the same mm. time. Um, and then, so they almost left. And then you relied on your guys from the generation. You almost skipped a bit of a generation, which would have been then my generation. And you, the next guys coming in were your, your, your guys who are also geniuses. Your Kahisa Rabada, your Quinton de Kock. Those kind of places. Now, those guys have gone from being youngsters in a team environment to being senior players. Just all of a sudden? Not, not middle of the group. They've gone yeah. from being a youngster in the side to a senior player. So yes, I think, yeah. yeah. So, I think that's obviously something that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, but as you said, that, that, that happened with that, with that generation we had. Obviously, it was an unbelievable side, unbelievable, you know, a couple of years that we had with that team. But there's always there's that pro, but there's always going to be a con somewhere. And I think that was obviously our issue is that we've kind of we're feeling the effects now of having such a good generation in that year that you know because it blocks other players from coming through, and that's fine because yeah. that's how the system works. If you've got a yeah. team that's winning, you don't change it, and that's True. that's obviously what happens. So so we've just got to have a little bit of patience. I think in terms of that we. We're not far off. We've still got players that are world class. But if you, as you say, we've just we've just missed a real, I suppose, six, seven, eight players core unit that have played a lot with each other as well. I think that's probably yeah. the, the the best way to sum it up. No, uh, definitely sure. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a ongoing talking point. But let's 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 move on to something else. Yeah, um, but early hours are, are always a good thing to watch. Um, and you obviously were picked for Pakistan. And it's always a, a funny thing because you, you touched on it a little bit earlier in terms of your batting. When the coach says to you, all right, you're going to bat number three now. What sort of goes through your mind, JJ? How do you sort of prepare yourself? And how do you say, okay, this is different. I was thinking maybe six. Here we are, number three. How do you sort of, what goes through your mind? Yeah, look, as I said, I, I've actually been, I, I use it kind of a, as a, as I say, as a, it's a, it's a real positive is that I started my career as an opening batter. So I, I've played, let's say I've played a hundred uh, uh, list day games. Um, I've batted, let's say in an opening position for probably 75 of those. And then the other 25, I've moved around a lot. I've batted three, I've batted six, I've batted four. So I've kind of been lucky that but also those two last 25 where I've batted all over the show have almost come a little bit more in the back end of now uh, of that hundred where I suppose that that opening position was a large part of it was all at the start of my career. So I've kind of batted in every scenario. So for me walking in now in a, in a different environment, diff a different environment in terms of batting position doesn't really scare me too much. Um, you know, I've always, I've always felt pretty comfortable opening the batting as well. So I'm pretty comfortable wherever I bat kind of thing. Um, and again, it's just obviously making sure that you, you're aware of certain certain things, you know, like um, when you open the batting, you, you're going to face a new ball, the ball could swing a bit and all that kind of stuff. And obviously, if you come in in the middle order at, let's say, six or seven, um, five around there, you, you've got to be prepared maybe in certain situations that um, a lot of slow balls are going to be bowled, the spinners will be on, 
the different situations like that. And it's just really about adjusting mentally into those scenarios and stuff like that. Interesting. Very, very interesting, JJ. Well, I think you, you really do make the most of your opportunities. So it's, it's good to see. But who has been, if you don't mind me asking, a bowler that has really nipped the ball around for you and given you a bit of a hot dog? Well, this guy's actually quick. Yeah, look, obviously, I think um, there are a few guys. I mean, I mm -hmm. faced Mitchell Stark for a little bit in wow. that um, in that Bloemfontein game where wow. we saw Rihanna Manalang got 100. He, he was fast. Uh, I faced Sean Tate in, uh, in, I don't know if you remember, the Champions League years ago. Yes. There's that tournament they used to have. That was, I faced him and he was really fast. Mm -hmm. um, Anrich Nokia, Kakiso Robata, two guys <laughs> as well. And they, 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 they're pretty fast, so... Yeah, look, obviously, um, the one nice thing about white ball cricket, though, is that you generally play on pretty pretty flat wickets. Um, oh, yeah. so, so so it is a little bit easier than, let's say, test yeah. cricket, where it can be a little bit tougher. Um, but yeah, look, obviously, those guys those guys are really, they're really skilled players and bowlers. Um, you know, and I think, uh, as you said, I think in the world at the moment, we're really blessed with some really world-class cricketers. I think mm. if you go around it... Um, I know everyone talks about the big four or the big five in the batting lineup, but I don't think we probably talk enough about the fast bowling contingent either in the world because there's some serious fast bowlers around in the world. Yeah. Them. And they can make that ball talk. It's interesting to see. Exactly. Interesting. Exactly. <laughs> but JJ, let's talk a bit about red ball then. And you have done very well. And what I mean is that your, I think your economy is just over three in terms of red ball cricket. That's jolly excellent. And that's, uh, I think, where your role really suits the team. You seem to pin the bats on down quite nicely. Is that something that you sort of aim for every game as well? Yeah, look, um, my four-day career has, has not planned out the way I wanted it to plan out, if I'm okay. honest. I, I, it's, it's kind of been a career of like two halves, if I put it like that. So I started my career pretty much as I just played as a batter um, and I was seen very much as a part-time spinner. Didn't really bowl much, which obviously frustrated me. But again, the system I grew up in, we had Rom Peterson, Johan Boerter, and then Nicky Boyer came along. So for me to bowl a lot of overs was quite was obviously quite difficult when you had three international spinners bowling kind of thing. Um, and then after that, Simon Armour came along as well. So, so it's another world-class spinner as well. So if you look at it in terms of that. So I played very much as a batter. Um, I actually did quite well. I was, I was a bit unorthodox as a batter opener. I scored very quickly. Um, almost non-traditionally in South African terms, um, you know, and, and what happened is obviously I, I, I had, let's say, two bad seasons where I really struggled with a bat and all of a sudden I, I kind of fell out of favour when it came to, to red ball cricket. Um, and actually what happens then is I had to pick up my, my white ball cricket and my white ball cricket then obviously went to a whole new level from there. Um, and then I started bowling a lot in white ball cricket um, and doing really well. And then... You know, I remember speaking to a few guys. I think Colin Ingram was one of the big guys I spoke to. And he said, well, there's no reason why you can't bowl in Red Bull cricket and become really good as well. So it's something I really worked on. And obviously with Red Bull cricket, it's also about um, being consistent. And then also I had to work on probably the action I have on the ball in terms of being able to create a bit of spin and a bit of bounce and stuff like that, which I've obviously worked really hard on. Um, but as I said, in the, last, in the last three years with the ball, it's the best I've ever bowled in terms of my stats in Red Bull cricket have been really good. I've, I felt a little bit unlucky in terms of the, the wickets I've initially got. I haven't maybe got the number of wickets that I could have gotten. I could have gotten a few more. But in terms of my, my, my role definition in the team, I've been really successful, as you said, in terms of holding up an end, yeah. being um, being able to bowl you know many overs for a few runs to allow the seamers to strike and stuff like that. And I think um, if you look at the wickets we play on in, in where I play on in terms of East London and Port Elizabeth, I've done... I've done that role perfectly in the last few years, um, you know, and it's been really, really nice to have that that string to my bow. Yeah, really. It just comes across, John, that you just you you've worked hard, you keep going at it, you you, you don't give up ever, which is brilliant to see, JJ. It's good. I think more people Thank need you. that um, because you know to get to the top is is a lot of work, and you've obviously been at the top playing for South Africa, so awesome to see. But you're also very successful when it comes to golf. I believe you got a hole in one after the third round. Yeah, look, that was that was that was more luck, let's be honest. But um, yeah, look, uh, it's quite funny because um, a few of my mates asked me, "Like, come start playing golf," and I had absolutely no interest in playing golf. I grew up also playing tennis quite quite um, 
seriously as a youngster. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, when I was there in my first few years in Port Elizabeth, I also did it at the varsity while I was playing for the Warriors. So during the winter, I played tennis quite a lot. You know, and I just decided one year, okay, let's go and play golf. My brother also kind of had just started playing and we had gone pack around and all that. And literally I was playing and we were probably on the back nine somewhere and it was, you know, kind of uh, this, you know, again, you kind of counting how, how many holes you got left so you can finish as quick as possible because yeah. the rounds not going well. And, you know, I kind of struck this perfect shot and I was like, no way, it's kind of thing. And I still don't believe that, it, I still can't believe that it actually went in the hole and all that. But as I say, that was definitely more, more luck than anything else. Um, and yeah, I can't see myself ever getting another hole in one ever again because I'm not ever going to hit it anywhere near, <laughs> near a, a pin. I can tell you that. <laughs> well, you might surprise yourself. Who knows, Jordan? You never know. But, I suppose that is true. Yes. Yeah, yeah. How do you get to play? Because doesn't the wind blow there like really, really badly? Yeah, look, it does. Um, you kind of get used to it though in PE. But obviously the one, uh, PE's winters are actually generally very nice. Um mm-hmm. April, May, June, July, the wind actually doesn't blow a lot in PE. Um, back end of July, that's when it starts getting really windy season again. So you go ju- sure. end of July, over September, October, it really blows again. But as you say, those winters you play and you're probably playing in about, where it's about 20 degrees, 21 degrees, and you're playing with not much wind. So it's actually very pleasant to play golf then. Um, the last couple of years, I've always, uh, that's my golfing season almost has been in the winter because as you said, the, the weather is perfect. And you can really go out and enjoy yourself. And we've got some really nice courses here as well. Well, that's good, JJ. And that's why I think um, balance is important. <laughs> yes, correct, correct. Uh, very important. Um, JJ, but when is the actual season meant to be kicking off now uh, with the new setup of the different systems, the different divisions? When is, because I assume it's still going to go uh, four-day competition, ODR, Oh, oh dear, sorry, four-day competition, 50 over, and then 2020. When, when are they meant to be starting? I, I, look, I had no idea on that. Um, well, again, it's generally it's around, up, yeah. around September or so, the season will officially start. But in terms of the fixtures and everything like that, the fixtures will all stay the same and everything like that. Um, yeah. whereas, again, as far as I know, where I'm talking about you'll play four-day cricket, one-day cricket, and T20 cricket. Yeah, yeah. perfect, perfect. Did it, have you, you've also got a business, don't you? No, no, no. I don't have any business. You don't have business. Okay. As, as you say, I'm a professional cricketer and um, yeah, I'm busy. probably getting to, the, I'm getting to that stage in my career now where um, I don't have 20 years left in my career. I've really got to start thinking also about, you know, what comes after cricket and stuff like that. So I'm going to have to say, have to sit down in the next couple of uh, couple of months and really have a look to see, you know, how much longer I want to play. Obviously, I still want to play for quite a long time still. But um, yeah, it's, 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 it's exciting times. But on that, JJ, and I, I think it's, and I'm talking about general sports now. I'm looking at some professional soccer players there in their 30s, 30, 37, 38. There's a guy playing county cricket now. He's 45. He's been taking wickets. Some rugby players like Ron Pina, 37, still playing for the Cheetahs. That A, that theory where once you're 35, you retire, that looks like that's going out the window. The guys are getting more and more fitter and able to play for longer. I, I would agree with you. I think... Um the the I'm gonna call it like the, the scientific technology in terms of gymming and stuff like that. Players can can really uh, prolong their career. I think if you look yeah. at Jimmy Anderson, Stuart Broad, case in point, stuff I mean, even look at as you say, footballers, Cristiano Ronaldo, those kind of guys. Um Incredible. if you go back twenty five twenty five years ago, those guys would have stopped playing already. But I yeah. think those players are now not just playing anymore, they're playing still at the highest level of the game it's as incredible. well. I think if you if you look at look at tennis as well your Djokovic's, your Nadal's, yeah. those guys. I mean, those guys is normally considered ancient, um, as you say, if you go back 20 years ago. I think um, just the way guys are able to train now in terms of there's so much more information with regards to recovery and stuff like that, that guys can just play for so much longer. Um, and obviously, that's a goal for me. I want to try and play. I've said it. I want to try and play till 40. Mm. Um, just uh, as I said, I've been, I've been blessed quite luckily that I, you know, I don't have a taxing role in terms of a bowl left them off spin and I'm a batter who scores a lot of runs in terms of boundaries. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guy who's quite an aggressive batter. So I've been very lucky in terms of that. So you never know what might happen. But uh, obviously, I think um, there are a few points that also have to come into that in terms of form, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. But also, I think that the, the coaches or the management, whatever it is, looks at it and says, you know what, these guys add so much to the change room. They've been in the system for so long, they understand how things work. 
it just adds more value. So keep them in it because, I mean, if they can perform, why not? So I think it bodes very well for you, John John. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, hopefully, as you say, hopefully that is the case. Yeah, because mm. I mean, as you say, I really, I really do love what I do. Mm. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, it'll be really exciting to to still have a couple of years left. Yeah, uh, for sure. And I mean, it's it's going to be good for you to be able to take part in this new cricket league. I think a lot of guys who have called it a day will be itching to experience it again. But unfortunately, their time is up. Yes, it's going to be really good to see. I'm looking forward to it. But yes. yeah, John, John, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you. Thank you so much for your time. It's really, really no, good. Absolute nice pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Really appreciate it. No, absolute pleasure, Ryan. Thank you for having me.